Okay, recording is live. Good evening, folks, and welcome to the first V Brown webinar of 2020. Um, sorry for the switch up today. Moving over to uh, Zoom off of the uh, previous uh, go to webinar. Uh, that was a fun afternoon of trying to get all that sorted out. So this will be a discussion around Azure and AWS, uh, which are topics we haven't discussed in a while. Um, tonight we're going to be talking with Jason McMinn, who's one of the Atlanta VMUG leaders and is also an Azure architect who's got a background in on-prem VMware infrastructures, AWS, and Azure. Um, Jason's got experience with architecting large-scale data center environments, migrating to the cloud, and now migrating across clouds, um, especially your most current project, which has involved company acquisition and migrating from one cloud platform you just finished architecting to another. Um, so we're going to be discovering some, uh, or covering some basics, pitfalls, and things that we didn't know that we didn't know about Azure, because you got to love those unknown unknowns. Um, yeah, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> first, a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. Let's get in on the conversation. So during the webinar, I'll be monitoring the Q&A, uh, and uh, we got that thread going for anybody that's live in the audience on the Zoom meeting. Um, you can also tweet to at bbrownbag or use hashtag bbrownbag, uh, and I'll be monitoring that on Twitter as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Oops, just realized I was not sharing the intro slides. Let's get... I was just about to tell you that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, this is how it goes, man. Okay, you know. So, there we go. All right, so, the brown bag. Failing from the clouds. It's going to be basics pitfalls and what you didn't know about Azure and AWS. Uh, so again, for everybody, <laughs> here's the uh, here's the Twitter handles and the hashtags to go ahead and use for tonight. Uh, these are the times for all of the other V Brown bags around the world that we've got going on. Um, I believe US was actually the last one to flip over to Zoom, so V Brown bag should now be entirely on Zoom, if I'm correct. Um, and again, we got Jason McMinn uh, chatting with me, Joe Hughes, so we can go ahead and get started on this conversation. All right. Let's get our talking points up. Okay. All right. Um, so really the, the conversation that we wanted to have, uh, you know, Jason and I, I chatted this out a little bit and, and he and I go back a ways, um, both being VMUG leaders and, and chatting at different conferences and stuff. And uh, we really just kind of wanted to have a, a conversation because Jason's been in an interesting position to where um, you had to migrate pretty much an entire on-prem environment to the cloud, and then once you got that done, moving that into AWS, you've, you've had to acquire another company, consolidate those environments, but also migrate everything to to Azure. So uh, you've got quite the perspective for most of us that that have not managed large-scale cloud in production, man. So uh, give us some background, like you know, tell us tell us your history um, from your perspective, and then and kind of what got you on this path. Sure. Uh, I mean, just for I'm. Some people know me. Some people don't. Uh, for the ones that don't, I've been in the industry uh, since I was literally 16 years old. My first job was in 1995 as an internet help desk technician back when, when it was like right before Windows 95 itself came out. Uh, you know, I was working with Windows 3.1 on dial-up modems and walking people through setting up their computers all the way back to what I do now, which is you know, uh, solutions architect for infrastructure and cloud now. So uh, I've done pretty much every job in the infrastructure kind of silo. Uh, you know, I spent many, many years consulting. So that's why I've kind of, uh, I've kind of uh, got some, like you said, interesting views on things because I've seen, a, I've seen a lot of different things where a lot of people go into their job, they, they go to college, they go into their job and they kind of, you know, they stick somewhere for, for years, you know, learning the ins and outs, whereas I kind of um, moved around a lot with different consulting companies and stuff like that. So, uh, like you said, I have an interesting perspective. I ran my own consulting company for about 10 years uh, before I went back to corporate America doing what I'm doing now. Uh, and that's where I did a lot of my VMware stuff. So, uh, like, you know, inside the VMware infrastructure, uh, my specialties were uh, storage, compute primarily. Uh, and then I, towards the end of when I was working hardcore in VMware, I was doing, uh, I was doing uh, VDI and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that, 
kind of trans I, I, an opportunity came up uh to start moving into azure uh that was about three and a half four years ago started working in azure uh kind of half and half azure i was working half in azure and half in vmware uh started doing some migrations from vmware to azure uh and you know and doing some hybrid cloud you know uh we would i had corporate it still in a VMware cluster in, uh, in the corporate office. And then we linked uh, back to, we moved all of our production stuff to Azure and we had ran pure hybrid cloud with like uh, Microsoft Express route and everything. So uh, I've had, like you said, I have had some different experiences and, and then the, the new company uh, I work for that I've worked for for the past year that you were kind of alluding to, uh, you were real close, you were real close on that. We actually, we went, we, we did them. When I got hired, I got hired last December 17th. Uh, our entire company was in Rackspace uh, hosted on VMware. We managed the VMware. I migrated everything off the VMware and they, well, I didn't migrate. We, we greenfielded and then migrated, migrated things as best we could between VMware and Azure, uh, you know, it, yeah, it, I, I guess I shouldn't have stated that as if it was it, just a straight lift and shift. No, no, no. It was <laughs> it, there was a lot that went on, and 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 that's what we're going to get into. And I'm gonna I'm gonna be real upfront about this. What I'm what we're about to talk to talk about is most of what I screwed up and did wrong, <laughs> and there was a lot. Um, luckily, we were the company I got hired for. Uh, hi hired to, excuse me. They hired me specifically because of my infrastructure background and the fact that, uh, unfortunately, the, the application that the, the company I work for writes has a lot of older legacy type code in it, like classic ASP and stuff like that. You can't do a lot of new, a, a lot of the new type of DevOpsy type stuff that you, you that you can do with a lot of modern code. You can't quite do with that yet. You still have to have infrastructure. So we had some challenges of trying to move into the cloud, but we still had to have some semblance of traditional infrastructure. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, I mean, that was the point that, that we had talked about before. Yeah, just yeah. The, like, like you said, don't build iron in the cloud. Like, don't just take that, your VMs that you have on-prem and try and build them wholesale just exactly like they're architected currently in the cloud. Exactly. And, and, and let me, let me, this is, that was my, that is my biggest lesson learned. You could probably see that on the slide. It's the, don't build iron in the cloud. And, and here that took, that took us probably the, the good thing was we were building Greenfield, right? We had six months to really build the Azure before we, we really had to turn the devs loose in it and and start you know preparing to move production over, and so I got to I got to rip up and rebuild about uh, literally about 15 times before I finally got it to the point where I where I wanted it to be, and and you know I'm building this stuff and I, and, and everything's everything's working fine. It's working just like you like you you would expect it to in a data center. But you're looking at the bills grow and grow, and oh my God, it's so expensive, you know. And you you you, you hear all these horror stories of people in the cloud, you know, building the cloud. And um, so the company I work for is a privately owned by a, an equity company, right? So they have they have they have some um, uh, they have some other companies like us that are in tech. And um, the CTO and I went and visited a couple of the other companies that were doing similar things to us moving to public cloud, stuff like that. And we sat down and talked with one of them and they kind of called us out on it. They, they, they kind of, you know, because it didn't, it didn't occur to us when we were architecting and building this. Uh, my, my CTO uh, is not your average desk t CTO. He's very much an infrastructure guy and a coder. He still gets his hands in and likes to jump in and work with us. He, he, so he's still very active in the in the actual engineering aspect. So we he and I sat down with this other company and they're like, "Look, you're doing it wrong," and we're like, I, I, "Excuse me," <laughs> and they're like, "Look, the thing with cloud is why your why your why your expenses are going out of out, out of control, right? Is you're treating it like it was a data center." You're building a, a shit ton of VMs. 
you're creating a shit ton of uh, storage and data and ingress and egress and you're trying to use it like a data center where where it's like in old days when you were in a data center and everything was metered right do 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 you remember those days joe back yes. when like power was uh, like every bit of power was metered right. every bit of cooling was metered charge you by the penny yes yeah right exactly that's what we're back to with cloud nowadays right well the only way cloud really becomes efficient and affordable is to use the platform services. Right. To use and they and the thing is 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 you know you got one set of platform services for AWS, you got one set of for Azure. They are very similar but they're called different things and they work different with differently. There's no mm -hmm. there's no it's it, it's it's like the difference between uh VMware and Citrix or VMware and Nutanix or what right. you know it, it's they all do the same thing but exactly how they do it is very different so I've been I've been waiting for this point to come up because we've actually got our first pending question so Graham Mitchell's got our first question of the year uh, his question was so why did you have to move cloud systems isn't multi-cloud a thing <laughs> So, <laughs> so this, I, under, I understand that part of the reason was the political and like the, the company that you guys acquired or absorbed or whatever was already running Azure, correct? And like they kind of went out with that part of it? No, no, we were running Azure. So the funny thing oh, okay, is, okay. is it, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's the most backward acquisition I've ever been in my, in my life. <laughs> um, we acquired them. But their CEO, CFO, and a couple other C levels became the new company CEO, CFO. So it kind of actually, where we mer we bought them. It kind in some ways it kind of feels more like they bought us. Yeah. <laughs> they were in AWS. They had been in AWS for seven years. We weren't even complete. We had not even done the final switch to prod. We had switched test UA, uh, test dev and UAT UAT is our pre-production you know right. basically User acceptance testing and all yeah, yeah yeah you know it it's for all intents and purposes it's prod because we treat UAT and prod as one environment that are considered upper environments and then our lower environments are dev and test so there's completely different security protocols and procedures for the upper and lower environments so UAT is treated just like like prod so we had not even flipped the switch for prod yet. Uh, I was about three weeks from flipping the switch on prod. I went to, I went to my CTO and said, uh, said, Hey, we've, I've got to start setting up the DR site. You know, I was going to use ASR and set up the DR site for our production environment, you know, so we could be good to go to go live. And he's like, yeah, about that. Uh, we've been mandated to move everything to AWS now. And it's funny that he brings up this question because I, I'm not going to name names, but we have one, our very largest client, let me put it this way, refuses to allow their data to be put on AWS. And by me telling you this, we right. can probably fig figure out who our biggest client is. <laughs> um, and they were, they, they're our biggest client. So right now I'm having to figure out a way of managing both Azure and AWS, but Azure is only for one specific client. The rest of our 100 or 150 clients is going to AWS. Um, and the, and yes, multi-cloud is very much a thing, but multi when you build for multi-cloud, you have to be able to containerize or, or, or Lambda or do something to that effect. With older code, you can't necessarily do it. So that's kind of why multi-cloud wasn't a thing for us. Because trust me, I fought this fight till I was blue in the goddamn face. <laughs> because for me, it's a nightmare. Because now I have to maintain two completely different infrastructures that are managed two completely different ways. Nice. Does that answer that question, I guess? I think so. I think it covers it pretty well. So, yeah, uh, th 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 I mean, that is the one thing I want to say with multi-cloud and and you know and stuff like that. You always have to consider what the what the end the application that you're hosting can it support those type of technologies. 
Right. Well, and, and some of it depends on if it's truly your application. Like, is your company doing the coding? Do they own that platform or are yes. you consuming another application that you couldn't change the architecture of it or the, the way that it functions or turn it into a uh, either distributed or microservices model? You know, if it's if it's just a thing that you acquired from somebody else, you bought a product and you're using it, then then you're limited by whatever was in the platform, you know. Um, so yeah, that's, that's always a difficulty. So uh, one of the other questions I was, I was going to ask about too, um, that, that Graham followed up with the, another question on as well. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Yep. So yeah, so um, you know, your, your, your discussion around the only way to contain costs uh, was to use the platform services. But once you're in a cloud or once you're on one of the public cloud platforms and you're consuming their um, you know, PaaS and SaaS services, are you are you then locked into that platform? You know, doesn't that doesn't that really tie you to their current model or their pipeline? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm not I'm not I'm not going to disagree. Uh, no, that's exactly my problem. I'm fighting right now. Uh, you know, is is if you go, it's kind of a it's kind of a catch twenty two in some respects. It's getting better with things like uh, you know AWS reinvent they. The AWS is basically launching their own, you know, hosted Kubernetes right on right on AWS that will integrate with Lambda and all those things. So AWS and Azure both are trying to make it easier to use things like containerization and stuff like that into their platform services. But yes, you still get somewhat locked in. You know, if you want to go truly cloud agnostic your infrastructure is probably going to cost you more than if you said, okay, we're going to build this application application from the ground up, but we're going to build it all on a AWS platform services or all on Azure platform services. Does that right. make sense? Yep. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, Graham's got a good point. Maybe the best way to win at cloud is not to play. Right? Yeah, you know, the house it, always it, wins. It's... Yeah, yeah, you know, and and that's the thing, and that's uh, a lot of people think because I work in cloud that I'm a, that I'm a big, I'm a big, you know, cloud sure. evangelist. I'm actually not. Uh, I'm one of those somewhat traditionalists that believe there are certain wor workloads that are tremendously made for the cloud, and it's a great place. And there are other workloads that I believe still belong in the data center or on-prem. Yeah. Um, you know, I think this this ginormous, you know, corporate shift to go CapEx versus OpEx, and that's the big thing that dr has driven cloud. Yes, that's the ma one of the main things that's driven cloud. The other thing that's driven cloud is uh, efficiency and rap rapid release, rapid build, you yeah. know, with a lot of the tools that are, are now in included in AWS Azure and, you know, Google Cloud coming up, you know, you can, <laughs> you can have a team of five people develop and run an entire application that it used to take, you know, 50 engineers, you know, a year or two to design and develop and, and these guys can do it in six months. Yeah. You well, know. but, but some of that comes from just like how the environment was, uh, was built. And, and I guess for the folks that are architecting it or are, um, at least managing it, you know, are you still tied to the legacy on-prem management? You know, are, are you used to having your tools with your, you know, I'll even say it like the, the old school vSphere, um, thick client, you know, crap like yeah. that. Do you have to have your, I want this GUI that's got a simple web form and click, 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 or are you doing, yes, or are you at least doing, you know, some coding or full infrastructure as code or, you know, SDDC via a full CI CD pipeline, you know, it's, it's some of it is, is how willing are you to put in the investment to either initially do that in the build or to learn that stuff along the way. Cause if you want it to stay the same as it's always been, you know, you might as well just go sit in the corner and, and, and wait to die. You know? and, and, and that's a lot of what we run into. I mean, uh, and I'm not trying to turn this into a, a kind of a bitch session with everything I see wrong with my job, but, you know, <laughs> consult, consulting, you know, and working for different companies and, and now getting this new experience with now I now I've literally done I'm doing basically like the third migration, you know what I mean? And yeah. a brand new architecture. Um, 
I've gotten a chance to learn and work and see a lot of different things. And it's, it's, it, it, it's like, you know, Graham had a very good point. Sometimes the only way is to, to win is not to play. I mean, to, to steal war games, it really is. Um, yeah. Because you've got to have an alignment. So, you know, I'll get into this a little bit more, maybe on this one, maybe the next one we do. But, you know, uh, you know, I have started doing infrastructure as code. I built all of Azure with infrastructure as code using Ansible. And now we're building most of AWS with cloud formation. But yeah. I'm actually taking a look at Terraform for that. I'm actually looking at Terraform right now for both Azure and AWS because it taught the, the Terraform itself is is very very good at at infrastructure tasks in both Azure and AWS yes. and a lot and a lot of people even claim that Terraform is better than AWS and Azure both are like uh, AWS has their cloud formation template uh, Azure has ARM templates right so right. it's ba basically it's all JSON or YAML yeah. you know that you can spit out of you know your your infrastructure with terraform has a much easier language than both of them i'm 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 messing with it right now and actually i kind of uh if, if it takes off hopefully in a couple months maybe i can kind of uh kind of maybe do one of these on on how to manage with terraform your infrastructure with terraform for both azure and aws because that's what i'm working on right now yeah that'd be cool well and, and that's one of the things for people to understand like it's it's not even just being tied to the platform and then the, the feature releases or development cycle of whatever public cloud that you're in and the company that's backing it, but your day-to-day -day management, you know, is, is going to be um, tied to those platforms somewhat. But if you, if you take a step back and you use some tooling like Terraform, that's a little more platform agnostic, you know, if you're deploying machines that live in, you know, your on-prem vSphere or, uh, AWS or Azure or Google Cloud or, or running stuff in DigitalOcean, you know, Terraform yeah. will do the translation to those platforms of what it is you're trying to do. And it basically just says, hey, I got this. Like, you tell right. it where you want it to run. There might be a few specific things that you need to know about that platform and how Terraform works with AWS and Azure. But mm -hmm. it's really, it's, it's the same tenets that come in with all of the, um, automation and infrastructure as code. It's just the fact that like learning a little bit of coding is not going to suddenly make you an expert in the platform. You have to know how to use those tools in the first place. This just helps you consume and use them a little bit easier. And, and Terraform just kind of adds in an extra layer where it's, it's a little cushier for the landing of, of suddenly like dropping everything into uh, you know, public cloud or, or shifting from one to the other. No, I, I completely agree with you here. And, you know, uh, you know, a little more on the, the cloud agnostic pains and some of this stuff is like, you have to have a dev team that is willing to change their code if you want to go the cloud agnostic way or if you want to go the full platform services way. Yeah. Because if you, it's like our application, right, we're not using someone else's application. We're custom writing software specifically for for what we do right we're, yes. we're, we're so we could rewrite that code and build it for cloud agnostic or for amazon platform services like the company we we acquired uses is 100 percent soup to nuts in aws yeah they, they use everything aws platform services um and where here, here is where the the sticky conversation gets in with we're the the company we acquired was very very already very heavy de DevOps like they have no ops team, their developers do their infrastructure their database everything. Yeah. Um, so when you come in, and you look at how they've built their infrastructure and every single server has a public IP on it, you know stuff like that. It's yeah. it, it's very it's laid out very much how you would expect a developer to lay things out. So you've got developers going out building like, oh, I can build infrastructure now because I can just code it. Yeah. But they don't have that infrastructure background to actually know what they've just done. Well, Does it, that, it, it, yeah, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's the other side of the, of the, uh, the coin, really, because it's the, they have the freedom of not being uh, saddled with the, I don't know, couple of decades worth of crap that most of us infrastructure guys carry around of like, oh man, I remember this back in the day, you know. Right, 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 and, exactly. Yeah. 
So they're, they're a little bit more free. Like, yeah, there may be things that they don't know that they shouldn't do. Um, and, and some of that comes down to either like kind of, I would say some basic um, infrastructure background or some of it's going to fall into basic security stuff that they just didn't realize is like a bad right. idea. Right. Um, but I think they're more willing to, like I would say a developer is more willing to um, consume most of the cloud services than most of us traditional infrastructure guys would be. I, I'm going to build my own server and do this. I'm like, that's dumb. <laughs> I, ag I agree 150%. Yeah. Um, the, they, you know, uh, they want to buy fully into platform services. Oh, it's already here and done for me. I just leverage this API and uh, that's all I got to worry about. Yep. Yeah. Um, they don't, they don't quite know under the hood what that means security wise or latency wise or any of that, that kind of stuff. Like you said, that us traditional infrastructure guys worry about. And sometimes we're, we, sometimes, Hey, we don't have to worry about it anymore. Sometimes we do. I'll admit as an old school infrastructure guy, I sometimes am way overly cautious and, and somewhat stodgy about who messes around in my infrastructure once I've built yeah, it, you know, right. <laughs> I still have those old school, you know, infrastructure things that were beat into my head for 20 years. Yeah. Well, so. but that's, that's the advantage of the DevOps, right? It's, it's taking the guys that will do the coding and do the continual um, improvement, you know, and, and putting that with the infrastructure folks who say, okay, it should be this way, or yeah, I guess we need to open up a little bit of control, but like, this is the guideline and the structure it should be. So like, you know, infrastructure folks should kind of be focused on more of the testing and validation to let the developer folks just go and kind of spin up whatever it is that they actually need to be able to consume and putting those people in a room, you know, hopefully with some pizza and not too many sharp objects. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> play nice and figure it out. You, know? you, you, you hit the nail on the head and you know, and, and the, and the thing is, is, and, and I'll call, I'll call us old infrastructure guys out on our own bullshit. Oh, we yeah. don't, we don't want to share some of our shit. Right. We don't, and we don't want people messing with our shit. Yep. So this is pushing the DevOps to go, fuck you ops guys. We don't need you. We're going to move towards a no ops, man, you know, model. Yeah. That was a big thing at AWS reInvent. There was a lot of discussion over no ops because no ops is becoming way more prevalent than people actually realize right now. <laughs> nice. I have to tweet that one out. That's a good one. What? That the no ops is becoming way more prevalent than people realize. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's the thing. If, if so, here's the pro, here's my, you know, and I'm not trying to turn this into a DevOps discussion, but the, 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 the problem with DevOps is DevOps means that operations and developers have to get along and they have to learn to give and, and get, right? And right now, devs don't want to give, infrastructure doesn't want to give. And I hate to say it, but us as infrastructure guys, if we don't learn to play better with the dev guys, we're going we're gonna to evaporate very quickly. Yeah. Be because of the cloud. Because truthfully devs can do it without us now can they do it as securely and maybe as efficiently or as as we could maybe maybe not do they have all the building blocks that we have maybe not but guess what there's there's companies out there that are going with a no ops mo model and not having any problem yeah well and and i would say you know like honestly the the point that you made there of can they do it as efficiently or, or are they going to you know structure it quite as securely as, as the legacy infrastructure guys are probably not on iteration one, but chances are they're going to be on iteration 15 by the time we're doing number three, you know, yeah. Cause, the, cause the, if we're, the, if we're not subscribing to the same, like, Oh, well crap, that sucked. Or I figured out that was a failure. Let me immediately scrap this and just go fix that thing and roll that out in V2 is like, this is something that's now not a problem. Right, exactly. Rap rapid revision, rapid development. They yep. can move much faster than we ever thought of. Yeah. Well, and 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 that's you know it's some of the the you know original, I don't want to say tenants, but but kind of catchphrases that everybody was starting to catch with the DevOps stuff of the you know um, servers as as you know cattle versus pets. Mm. It's the 
you know, yeah, mo most of the time a developer, if they say something is not right or it doesn't exactly meet their needs, they're, they're going to be much more willing to just trash and, and redeploy an entire environment rather than infrastructure guy who's going to try and make it a special snowflake or do everything that he can to avoid, you know, deleting and redoing something. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So, so, you know, I, uh, I, I say that we are in a, we're in a, servers are no longer, a, well, servers haven't been a commodity in a very, very long time, but VMs are not a commodity anymore, right? The, what, the way that DevOps want to want to build applications and the way a lot of people, especially in AWS, are building things is servers are disposable, okay? You don't patch a server. You don't, uh, if it has any kind of memory leak or any problem like that, you don't, you don't troubleshoot it. You delete the son of a bitch, you rerun the script, you redeploy the application, it's back in the load balancer in five minutes. Right. I mean, I, I did that today, literally. Yeah. It, you, you know, you know it, it, it's, it, that, that's the way the culture, the, the culture is going. You're very, you're very correct. Those little infrastructure guys, we, we, we liked our hardware. We liked our SANS. Even when we went to virtualization, we liked being able to walk into that data center and put our hands on that, on that, on that hardware. And, you know, it, it's, it, it makes us slow. Right. Now, there are advantages to that, that model, but the world is not sticking with that model. Right. Well, that's the thing is, is you know, any, any individual on the team or a team of folks or an organization sticking to a model like that will get surpassed. But at the same time, you know, it's it's one of the things and like the, the, the few times I get in conversations with folks around around DevOps stuff, because to be honest, with with our VMware crowds, this is not typically a thing that, that comes up in conversation, you know, um, yeah. unless somebody like just finished reading um, the Phoenix Project over the weekend or something. Yeah, right, but, right. You know, one of the great points that I heard, um, actually, it was it was through my other user group, the PowerShell user group. We we were hosting um, Jeff Snover and Jason Helmick, um, and and Jeffrey Snover, the guy who who was the father of, of PowerShell for the Windows platform, and and I would say the one who really kickstarted like the foundational building blocks to actually make um, Azure possible. You know, mm -hmm. for for a lot of Windows folks to even be able to consume a service like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he made the point, you know, it was, it was a whole conversation they had that was just around digital transformation. And it was, right. you know, the point he made was um, focus on the things that make your company better at what they do. Like by fixing this thing, are you going to make more widgets or whatever XYZ thing it is your company does that makes them money? Mm -hmm. If not, then get the hell out of that business. Yeah. And he stood right there and he was like, this is the reason that Microsoft will never have a technical fellows of cafeterias. He was like, that's not our business. We provide great food for everybody on campus. We want to make that a thing that nobody ever has to spend a second of thought on that. It's just provided. It's there. It's done well. And Microsoft pays a big fat paycheck to somebody else to make it their problem. And he was mm -hmm. like, all of you folks in the room right now, raise your hand if you're you know, still an exchange administrator. And he was like, no offense, and I'm not trying to put the sales pitch on here, but he was like, that's stupid. You know, for the for the five or seven bucks a month, like make that Microsoft problem. Because you know who runs Exchange better than you? Microsoft. Microsoft, right. right. It's the it's the, you know, if it's it, as much tooling and stuff as you guys could do to make this stuff better for a specific cloud platform or to make it a little more agnostic that you could ship from one cloud platform to the other, like in the end, is that really going to affect your bottom line versus the 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 hopefully slightly increased cost of whatever it is in the current fashion to just kind of leave it as is, or like you said, not refactor that entire application, just have VMs that live in the cloud that are able to consume the old ASP.NET code rather than having to refactor all of that into like new .NET core and, and whatever's the new iteration of the, the ASP stuff, you know? Yeah, right. Exactly. It's the, is it worth going and, and forklifting or, or breaking up and, and re-architecting and then recoding all of that stuff that's probably a, you know, 10 plus year old application with tons of stuff tied to it. Right. It's probably better to just take the hit of the cost of the VM and just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's, that's what this all comes down to. And I, and I think us as engineers, a lot of the times, um, maybe us guys that have been in it for years and we're closer 
we're closer to the management level now than we used to be. Yeah. We, we understand that at the end of the day, it all comes down to dollars, dollars and cents. Right. That, I mean, I mean, you know, what's the old adage my old man used, uh, uh, money talks and bullshit walks. I, right. I think, you know, and, and, and that's what this all comes down to is the almighty dollar. What is going to be the most efficient way, cost the least of money, amount of money to, to manage and handle and run, but make us the most money. Right. And that's what that, that, that's what, that's what most of the time ends up winning that, winning the conversation. Yeah. In my, in my estimation, at least. Yep. I would say so, man. It's, um, oh man. All right. So I, I guess before we get too far into, you know, trying to <laughs> solve all the world's problems with, uh, with DevOps stuff, let's, let's take a step back and, uh, and go over. Sorry. So no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, we got I, sidetracked there. I get, I get totally into the conversation as well, but, but, you know, at least for the point that we told people we were going to cover yeah, some, yeah, of, the, yeah. some yeah. of the basics. Um, yeah. so let's, let's talk, you know, like traditional VMware, because that's, that's going to be a lot of our users uh, or a lot of the listeners are going to at least understand that infrastructure that model and that terminology so mm -hmm. looking at at vmware and on-prem infrastructure and networking to azure to aws mm -hmm. what's like what are what are the the biggest fundamental differences when it comes to just um like vm and networking because that, those are going to be probably the two earliest hurdles that somebody's going to hit when they're trying to go with the cloud yeah uh so I'll, I'll say this. Um, I'm going to preface this with now having worked in Azure for three and a half, no, four years now, and now, you know, almost a year into also working in AWS. Uh, the first thing when you come into either one of those, if you want to do anything, is you got to build a network, right? Your first thing that you really have to do outside of like your account structure for the council and all that stuff, like the first thing you actually have to, you know, build before you start building VMs or anything like that, it is your network layer. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this part of the discussion with if you're a if you're an old school Windows admin, Active Directory, you know, Windows Server, all that, Azure is where is where you belong and Azure is where you're gonna go in and you're gonna putz with Azure for a couple of weeks and you're gonna go, oh, this makes sense to me. Because it it, it works like most other Microsoft applications have worked over the last 20 years. It's going to, after you walk around it for a little while, it's gonna feel like home. Now, yeah. you, you, if you're one of those guys and you go into AWS, you're gonna be like, what the serious hell, I'm lost. Uh, you know, AWS to me, I, I tell AWS to me, people that are into open source, Linux, all that kind of stuff, are going to feel much more home at, in AWS than they are in Azure, and Windows people are going to feel much happier in Azure. Uh, yeah. So, the the network different differences to me are some of the actually the first ones that you see are they're really striking. So, when you go into Azure and you need to build your very your very basic network, right? The, your network, the object you have to create that is your network is called a VNet, virtual network, right? You go in and you create your virtual network and that gives you, you know, so you go in like, and you create a, a CIDR that's a slash 16, right? So in, then you go in and you create your sub, your different subnets, like, you know, that's a couple hundred subnets you can have up to. We use a slash 16 just for, for growth. I mean, but we only actually have like 40 subnets. So, uh, but we still use a slash 16. It's just how we, how we designed it for, future proof right. um but uh you when you create that in uh in azure it does all the network plumbing for you it creates it does all your route tables for you it creates all your 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 network endpoints and your nat gateways and and basically plums the internet and basic network connectivity for you you basically can at that point once you build that first vnet and you answer the questions like here here's here's your here's your here's your here's your vnet then here's all your subnets once that's built you can you know you can specify you know you know you can tell it like dhcp options of like what you know dns servers you want you can do all that stuff like you could on a real network right right 
you can then go in and spin up your first virtual machine, a Windows, a Linux, whatever. It's going to come up online. It's going to be assigned. Uh, you know, if you set it for DHCP, it's going to be assigned something out of the DHCP pool. If you set it for static, it's going to be, you know, something that whatever you set it to. But it's going to be up online and be able to get out to the internet with no problems. Now, you do that in AWS. So first of all, so in Azure, like I said, networks are called VNets, virtual networks. In Azure, you got to do the same thing. You got to build your network layer before you can build, build a virtual machine and, and do anything. Uh, in AWS, your VNet is called a VPC. Uh, and that's your, that's your network layer in Azure. Uh, your VPC in, in AWS is, you know, you got a, you got a main network cider and then you've got all your subnets. The main, the main difference between AWS and Azure is AWS doesn't do any of that underlying plumbing for you. You, when you build your VPC, you don't have any, if you, if this is what's called a private VPC, which is meant for, you know, a private network. Uh, now, if you build a public VPC, you, it, 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 <coughs> all your, all your machines are meant to have public IPs on them. And at that point, of course, they have internet in a, in a private VPC, which is in Azure, your, your VNets are almost, are always private. And then you, you pipe the internet in, however, you know, through NATs and all that. AWS is the same way, except for when you build that private VPC, then you have to go in and you have to create an internet gateway and a NAT gateway and route tables. And you have to do all the plumbing yourself instead of, uh, instead of just being given, okay, here's your VNet. It's all ready to go. So basically what Microsoft did is what they did, what they always do, right? Azure came out, you know, four or five years after AWS really got rolling. Microsoft sat back and watched what AWS did, and they did what they normally do. They 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 saw what worked. They saw what the way that eighty percent of the people used it, and that's what they copied, and they made it better. And right. they said, okay, this is the configuration that eighty percent of the people that are in the cloud are going to use. That's going to be our default configuration, and that's how you, and that's how we provide it to you. Now you can make different, you can make the changes just like you can in AWS, but they're a little more complicated to make in Azure. Yeah. Um, AWS. I, I think their goal was, was even a little bit like, not only will this hit the 80% mark of what people would, what, what, what 80% of the folks would consume out of the cloud, but by making these additional tweaks, like your, your quote, make it better a little bit, you know, the, the extra little layer of peanut butter they put on the top was, the stuff that makes it easy to migrate from legacy enterprise to Azure and have it still seem pretty fairly comfortable. You know, it's, it's, it's not a huge drastic shift to the way that, like you said, you know, AWS, you go look at that and you're like, Holy crap, what is this? You have to right. define and declare absolutely everything. Right. And, 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 and AWS out of the box is slightly more configurable than Azure because of that, but you lose some serious, uh, you lose some serious time and, and especially when you're learning it, you spend a lot of time going, well, okay, that kind of makes sense. And actually I want to call this out. Graham said, first thing you need to realize is there's no L2, L3 only. He is exactly correct. Yeah. That, I was going to ask about that, especially with you guys having some legacy applications. Oh did yeah. You, did you uh, run into problems where, where the application just assumed that, that layer two and, and service discovery was, was like always there and accessible? Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so this is a, this is a little more advanced network can of worms in Azure. This is one of the, uh, this is one of the, um, this is one of the, the, I spent about a month in the Azure build process, banging my head against the wall because of load balancers and such, because there was no layer two. Um, the, it's it gets very quickly convoluted. I'll, that is the one place that I will say I really I tend to like AWS over Azure is uh, some of their load balancer, you know, their built-in load balancer and network stuff like that is somewhat easier to configure and 
can has has a little more power than some of the stuff that were originally in Azure. Azure in the last couple months has actually gotten a lot better with some of their network stuff. They have some better load balancers coming out and like, like I'll say this, <laughs> excuse me. When we were originally built for Azure, um, I wanted to use Azure load balancers, but I really couldn't get because of the no access to layer two. I really couldn't pull off everything I wanted to do with the native Azure load balancers. I ended up having to make a load balancer sandwich. Basically I had an, <laughs> I had an external, Azure load balancer and an internal Azure load balancer that had a Kemp ADC cluster in between them. And that's, that's how I was. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about fun? Let's talk about fun. Oh yeah. That's literally what we did. So, uh, AWS, we, at AWS were able to do all of our load balancing with native, uh, with native AWS tools. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it, it, that's, that's one of the places we're saving a little more money in AWS because we're we're not having to use some third party kind of applications to do some of that network layer stuff that we were having to do in Azure. Azure's come up with answers now where you can do stuff like that. They're, like their application gateway now uh, gives you a lot of the same access uh, that you would have if you not if you were on layer two, but it would give you the same type of access as if you had kind of that load balancer sandwich with more of a, uh, you know, a third party, more fully featured traditional like load balancer. Right. So. Okay. So everybody should understand that everything is layer three. It's all routing in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, like you said, Azure is at least a little more open. Um, AWS, it's got to be probably more strictly defined. I think Graham's got a good point that. Uh, yeah. Azure networking is probably easier for server folks, whereas AWS networking is easier for networking people. That that's exactly correct. Like if you're if you're a Cisco guy or or Arista or just a network engineer in general, you're going to go into AWS on the network stack, and it, it's going to make mostly make sense to you. Yeah. Uh, a, a server person is going to go into to uh, to to Azure's network stack and go, oh yeah, this makes sense. Right. Uh, the, either one of them that doesn't have experience with the other goes into either the other and they're going to lose their friggin' mind. Right. And, and also I want to, I want to comment on something Graham said also the other network thing to remember is that data going in is basically free data going, coming out is damn expensive. He's exactly right. Uh, ingress isn't that bad. Egress kick you in the balls every time. Well, and, and to your earlier point of, you know, why you would still argue that some applications or some platforms are just really not meant for the cloud. I mean, yeah, data gravity is is huge that a lot of people don't think, you know, like, oh, that's great. I can do quick development and I can just throw up, um, uh, you know, front ends for everything. But if it's still coming back to either your on-prem infrastructure or you know, a, a different uh, region that you've got all your data living in, you know, and, and especially if you don't have that architect properly to use internal backbones to keep that traffic within the cloud. If you're, if you're going outbound and inbound, you know, in between making stupid hops, then yeah, that's, that's going to be just absolutely tons of, of pennies that add up quickly. Right. Um, and, 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 and sometimes it, like, especially if you're throwing a massive amount of egress out over like VPN or something like that, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this, the company I worked at before the one I worked at now, uh, we ended up putting in an express route for exactly that reason. Yep. If you have an express route to, to one of their data centers, your egress charges are way cut down, like big time. You, <laughs> you get a, a faster service, but you're going to have to pay for that fiber circuit. So, right. yeah, yeah I, it's, it's really just, you know, where, where do you want to have the cost where do you want to have the control or sometime right. it's you you may have more expensive cost for express route but in the end it might end up being a extremely cheap or a consistent cost um insurance policy as opposed right. to like you know 100 100x increase on on bandwidth because somebody wasn't paying attention one month and put in a bad route somewhere exactly uh, you know, exactly it's, it's stuff that you just either should be aware of or yeah, sometimes it's worth the expense of the CYA if you can build it in. Right. Um, yeah, totally with it. 
so around your points for for yeah like using the right tools for the for the right job you know i mean yeah we, we've already covered a couple of the basic pain points for people to just learn you know that that yes, obviously there's going to be core differences when it just comes to networking in the cloud in general, much less between AWS and Azure. So, what I guess what were the what were the biggest pain points you ran into for Azure, and what were the biggest pain points you ran into for AWS? Uh, I think we hit on one of them in Azure. Uh, it was some of the the load balancing was uh, kind of a the load balancing was kind of a a, a pain in the ass in Azure. The other place that Azure wasn't quite as good as AWS, but they're very quick, quickly catching up was uh, AWS, S3 was their first real application in AWS, right? Yeah. S3 is very, very polished. It's very good. Uh, Microsoft has had a rough time replicating that. Uh, Microsoft's version of S3 is blob storage. Right. Um, they, they're, they've quickly caught up, I'll say that. And the, the one interesting thing that I found in cloud, right, is that storage is the one thing that hasn't quite moved along as fast as the compute and the application stuff. Storage, like the access to cheap storage, like S3 and Blob are your cheap storage in cloud, right? Your, your EBS volumes in, uh, your EBS volumes in AWS, which is what your OS is run on, on the EC2 instances uh they're they're your most expensive discs uh blobs your 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 cheapest here uh azure, and, and azure you've got you know standard storage premium storage then blob storage is your cheapest here and there's three different types of blob storage there's warm cool and cold i think uh and i think aws has uh warm and cold um and that's and, before you get into like the what is it the glacier and then the yeah the glacier yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 so the one place that i've been really frustrated with is you know storage when you have to use true storage you know ebs volumes or standard or premium storage in, in azure it gets real expensive real quick those discs can cost cost decent amount of money. I mean, your disk can cost as much as the compute for your machine, you know, uh, depending on the size of your disk. And come on, let's be honest, us old school infrastructure guys, we're not, we don't like making volumes that are exactly the right size for the data. We like making sure there's lots of extra. And when you do that in the cloud, it costs you money. Right. Uh, it's not like you got a, a you know, a, a pure, a, a pure uh, you know, uh, or whatever, any kind of storage device sitting there that's got, you know, 100 terabytes that, you know, carving off, a co uh, you know, carving off 500 gigs, you know, you're not even going to notice it. It's not like that in the cloud. You've got to pay for everything you use. Even if that, even if that storage is sitting there empty, if it's allocated, you're paying for it. Yes. So the one, the one place that I, I, I have a big, that I find it as a big pain point ha is, there are, one of the reasons I said Pure is Pure is one of the companies that's actually developed a way of leveraging the cheap storage, the S3, the Azure Blob, and using small instances of EBS and compute volumes and creating basically disk caching that, that basically writes all your S3 stuff to disk, it, it's just like, it's how a hardware stand works for us with tiering, right? Yeah. So it's tiered onto the fast storage and then on the back end, the storage controller moves it off to the proper cool tier, right? Same thing in, in the cloud, except for they're using EBS volume and compute to, to create vir like a virtual SAN and then they tier off to S3. Right. And then it calls it, you know, and then then the storage cluster itself controls how that gets pulled and pushed back. So basically, at that point, you're using your cheapest tier of storage in the cloud, but still getting your performance level tiering out of it. Right. So I, I think as we see stuff like that, we're going to see some we're going to see uh, some more changes in cloud. But that that's the one place that I feel like clouds kind of lagged behind is in the, the, the cheap and efficient storage. We don't you know, 
the days of going and dropping a million dollars on a sand are not are not really there anymore unless you you know you're a fortune you know 500 company yeah you know what i mean yeah so that's been i i think that's been one of the lagging points of uh, you know on both of the, on both of their parts is you know a, a lot of times i want the ability to just be able to i don't need to run a database off it but i would like to be able to mount a terabyte drive that's blob storage and have that mount to, to something in my ec2 volume or a vm in azure and not have to pay those ginormous you know premium storage when i don't need that level of performance does that make sense right yeah you need you need you know a large amount of usb disk space <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> right right exactly um so so let's dig in so you know beyond the pain points what would you say are the are the the things that you're most excited about or the things that you think that each platform did the best um you know uh so azure hands down their their azure active directory is basically the core of azure azure active directory is what controls your your account, your, you know, your users permissions to the council, your user permissions to the CLI. It's just like using AD and windows, right? You've got users, you got permissions, you got ACLs, you got all that stuff, right? That for someone that's traditional active directory server guy makes so much, uh, uh, so unbelievably good sense. Mm -hmm. um, they do their account structures and, you know, single sign on all that, they do that better than AWS to me, hands down. I prefer the, the like the account and council management portion of Azure to me is a million time, my, times more polished than AWS has ever thought of being. I hate AWS's whole IM system and all that. It, it's, oh, man. It, it's more of a pain in the ass than you can ever frigging imagine. And, and trying to centrally manage that compared are trying to say so azure central management is like that it, it's just set it and forget it that it's built on central management it's the only way of doing it yeah. aws is a completely different story i know the first time i opened up the the im user guide trying to figure it out to go build some users and, and groups and, and a couple of policies i don't know four years ago or something i got like the what somebody said was like the dummies guide for it or like the simple you know um quick version that was like 58 pages and i was like what the fuck is this it's yeah, it, ridiculous it, you hit the nail on the head so yeah. azure does that really well azure does your azure does if you're like we alluded to earlier if you're a windows server guy and you're trying to build some infrastructure in the cloud to do hybrid cloud or maybe to create you know small lab networks or whatever Azure is amazing for that. If you just want to be able to be as a, not a cloud architect, as a novice, as someone that's just trying to move from infrastructure or dip their toe in the water, Azure's going to be, Azure's learning curve to me is about 50 times easier than AWS's. It really is. Um, yeah. Uh, the Azure... Azure, to me, the machines, uh, you know, I like how the machines and I like the count, uh, the council on Azure is really good. I like how the machines uh, feel in Azure. They feel somewhat snappier. Uh, the interfaces feel snappier. Um, AWS, you know, AWS, the Windows things don't feel as fast as they could be. I think Azure is much better at tuning their VMs for their environment, if that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, you've got a, a point on here for um, the the CLIs and how they differ. Um, yes. So I was I was interested in in this. Are you talking just the the native CLIs, the the toolkits that are actually produced by the AWS and, and Azure? Yes, uh, completely. Okay. All right. Yeah. So to me, um, the Azure CLI, uh, all of its tool sets, all that are very, if you're a PowerShell guy, yeah. like you could, you, if you went in there, Joe, you would probably figure it out and nothing flat. You're a PowerShell. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it is, it is fairly easy. And I will say it definitely sticks to the, 
PowerShell object oriented method or or for anybody that was decent with not even power CLI, but but old school ESX CLI stuff back in the day. It's it's kind of the building tree of this is the node I'm going down the path to to change all these settings and it just kind of follows that. Right. It it it, it and and it doesn't matter if you're doing a DNS change or building a machine or building a VNet or building a load balancer. The codes are the, the the commands are all structured pretty much the same way, and if you know how that command structure goes, it flows. AWS's feels like more hodgepodge together. It's uh, there's a lot more uh, the language for the CLI does not flow like it does if it was PowerShell or something like that. Yeah, all right. It, it, it's it's very, you have to be very much more targeted and specific with AWS than you do with, with Azure. Uh, Azure is much more unified over the hood, under the hood. Like you, it, you could have a, an Azure uh, AD account, right? That, and your organization could have three different subscriptions under that account and you can seamlessly move with one command between those accounts and and run the same type of commands where AWS it seems like a three or four step procedure to do the same thing. Yeah. Nice. Uh, no, <laughs> th th that's exactly right. Azure 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 feels like was built by a company. AWS feels like it was built. It was something I built that added something else. Then Joe added something, and we didn't really talk to each other. Yeah, that's good, Graham. That's it's <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, the CLI uh, and the interface are the same for for AWS. Yeah, uh, you know, if you go if you go into uh, if you go into uh, AWS, you know, and you look at the services just in the console, not the CLI. I mean, there's something like ninety or a hundred, right? There's just services for everything. Yeah, Azure's is doesn't Azure still tries to keep it somewhat uh, categorized, if that right. makes sense. It's yeah. much more managed. Well, and I, I think, again, I think it was built as, as an easier catalog for, you know, enterprise or for, for traditional infrastructure folks. You know, it's, it's searchable based on the, you know, all you're going to look for is some known keyword that you have, and we're going to make it easy for you to find the 10 things that relate to that, whereas AWS, it's the you hit storage and you might hit three results when there's actually 30 of them that relate to it, but they don't know what the hell you're looking for because you said storage as opposed to S3 or block or. or right. Like, exactly. You know, yes. Yeah, they, did, they didn't put in all the additional extra aliasing and keywords to just make it more searchable and consumable. Whereas that seems to be one of the primary focus for Azure because like, this is why I will never, ever, ever bet against Microsoft in the long game. And especially now with, with all the changes that came under, um, Satya and, and all the, the fantastic stuff, you know, I mean, once, once Jeff Snover and, and Mark Rasinovich got put into like leadership roles, like it was, it was, it was quickly like trying to, to turn the, the ship, but Microsoft plays the long game and, and you just don't ever bet against Microsoft because nope. they they'll are at least the ones that realize that the they'll only outlast way you. They'll, outlast well, you. they'll outlast you or they may be the, the the second ones or the third or the fourth to the finish line of this thing but when it gets there it's it's going to end up being a more polished product and even their version one is going to be like wow why didn't everybody else do this or it's the oh my god they make it so much easier for me to find all this stuff in azure because they I, realize I, if you can't I, find it you can't spend money on it <laughs> I, I well, I think I think the word we're looking here for between the biggest word that we're looking for the difference between AWS and Azure, yeah. at least from a from a interface and CLI standpoint, is polish. That's yes. the word. Yep, polish. Yeah. Um. You know, and, and Graham just made a good point. It feel Azure feels like a product. AWS. Uh, a, a, Azure feels like a project. AWS feels like fifty projects thrown together. I think that's a good, I, I, I think that's, yeah. I, 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 AWS is a little better than that now, but it, from a, from someone that's just looking at the console, that's how it appears. Right. Absolutely. 
All right, so uh, so templates. Um, I, mean, I haven't dealt with cloud formation in a long time myself, and when I did, it was it was absolute hell. Um, has it gotten any better? Is, is cloud formation still just as bad as it ever was? I, you know, okay. So from someone that taught himself infrastructure as cloud and taught himself Ansible, and now trying to learn Terraform. Um, so I'll I'll be honest. I haven't done a lot of the cloud formations. I'm uh, cloud formation. I'm doing a lot of it. The, the guy that actually uh, works for you know works on my team. He's he's handling a lot of the cloud formation because I'm spending more time architecting for this this or that or right. doing R and D. Uh, so I don't have a lot of time to script the cloud formation. But the cloud okay. formation to me, I, I I have been doing it. Um, the cloud formation to me is about fifty times harder. Uh, than ARM templates or Ansible or Terraform or Puppet or Chef or any of those. Yeah. Cloud formation just, you can look at the code and you're like, what the fuck am I looking at? <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know what I mean? It, it bounces all over the place. You've got, you've got, you've got uh, resources, you've got outputs, and then you've got parameters and how they all reference each other. And then how you reference stacks to it. it it's cloud formation to me is very, very complicated where it doesn't need to be because if you use some kind of third party tool, it, you know, like Terraform, like you said, it's an interpreter. It know you tell it what to do in its language and then it knows how to communicate with AWS through a CLI or Azure through its CLI and do its job. Right. Nice. Um, so here's an interesting question. So I, I don't know if you've done much with them, but what are your thoughts, uh, tying it a little bit back to the VMware stuff? Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you've at least seen both of the platforms. So what are your thoughts on VMware Cloud on AWS as opposed to the VMware Cloud solutions on, on Azure? Uh, sorry, say that again, I'm sorry. So just thinking about like, there, we now have VMware Cloud on AWS, which is mm -hmm. you know, essentially just vSphere hosts that are, that are you know, bare metal instances living in an AWS data center, mm -hmm. but you know, they're, we get the, we get the management of the VMs inside of that, right? But, but not in the, none of the backend stuff, right? It just gets built out as a, as a vSAN cluster with NSX layered on and, and all of that. And the only yeah. management we've got there is traditional vSphere, which works. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a linked vCenter that's out there. Right. As opposed to the, the new VMware cloud solutions on Azure, which gives you the ability that like through the stuff that, that was all done with cloud simple and virtue stream, they've got, you have the ability to manage either your your VMware workloads with all the traditional vSphere tooling and coding mm -hmm. and all that, or they're truly like first class citizens. They're vSphere VMs that actually show up in the Azure portal, and you can you can deploy right. them all through ARM templates on that. Right. So, so, uh, so what are your Azure, thoughts? So yeah, with that kind of thing, Azure to me, uh, you know, it, it's small. <laughs> If you want to use VMware in the cloud, to me, the Azure way is the smarter way of doing it because of what you just said. You, you've got more of a single pane of glass. It's more, it becomes more of your, your vSphere setup becomes more of your Azure, uh, it becomes more of your Azure environment, right? Whereas in AWS, if you have a vSphere deployment there, it's, you're literally using AWS as a data center for vSphere. That's it. Yeah. Does that make? I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, honestly, when I when I saw it, uh, I was up at the the New York, New Jersey uh, user con um, mm -hmm. when when I sat in uh, Jeremiah Dooley's presentation on it, and I, I'd read about it, but I hadn't really dug into it that far. And it wasn't until he actually pulled up and showed, he was like, "Hey, look, here's the ARM template for my vSphere VM." I was like, "Holy crap!" Like, that's yeah, right. Like, that's, that's right. Fantastic, they, you know, they, yeah. they tied. They tied. They through through their coding wizardry, they tied the fabric of Azure and the fabric of vSphere together, so they can send each other commands. Basically, yeah. All right. And you know, integration. They've integrated vSphere into Azure in 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 some way, whereas AWS has gone. Okay, here's a container for your vSphere. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very nice. All right. Um, so, I mean, like those were all the points we had to at least to hit. Uh, obviously, start with you know, don't build iron in the cloud. Um, consume PaaS and SaaS. Um, I, I would say at least as possible or as it's intelligent for your company, not just blindly. 
Yeah, um, correct. Yeah, start for those of us that are still tr traditional uh, infrastructure guys or, or still more operations focused than DevOps focused, you know, start looking at automation for, uh, for infrastructure management, start considering doing infrastructure as code. Um, Correct. That's a big one. Yeah. So move to the cloud, meet equals route everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, it, I mean, it seems like really the biggest pain points are, are going to be either stuff that people just need to understand about the, the, the shift in thinking going to running infrastructure in the, ca the cloud or going two steps, which is to actually run it, you know, cloud native and, and run it. Um, Serverless and, Lambda. Stuff yeah, like that. at least at least you know distributed as opposed to to just you know I've got this one monolithic thing that only does this one function. Right, um, exactly. That, or sorry, that runs all the functions instead of just one. Um, <laughs> all right, we got a couple of hecklers of uh, you know, or just run VM, VMware on prem where you have full management of everything. Yeah, right. And right, then right. the uh, yeah. I, I, I thoroughly, I, five, not feature complete. So. Yeah, I, 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 I thoroughly <laughs> expected the hecklers. I mean, yep. come on. We are talking yep. about cloud. Yeah. So. Um, all right. Yeah, I, I would say this is definitely like it's it's good stuff for people to to know. Um, hopefully, people got a little bit out of our ramblings around the DevOps and just the, uh, the 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 shift in thinking for for moving stuff to the cloud. Um, so yeah. Um, any closing thoughts? Any any big huge takeaways that we missed that somebody needs to hear? <sighs> You know, uh, we we talked about a lot. Like, <laughs> I I knew this would happen with it being me and you because we 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 like to have conversations like this at you know two o'clock in the morning and yeah. you know <laughs> you know and end end up talking at you know till six a.m. You know, right. we up the next morning. So I knew this would happen, but no, I I think I think I got out there kind of really. I really wanted to start a conversation about this because I feel like it's a conversation that some people are really scared about. And I feel like, because, and, and I'm going to, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be a man about this and say, it scared the shit out of me of this transition to infrastructure as code, DevOps, all that. It, it is scared the living shit out of me. You know, it's, it's been a whole nother uh, technology shift and I've seen a few in my 20 some years working in IT. So, I kind of wanted to start a conversation and say, hey, guys, you're not the only ones out there that are scared shitless about this and don't know where the hell to start. Right. Um, if I can if I can get one person to, to – if I can save one person some of the trouble and hours of banging my head against the wall, uh, then it's worth it to me. You know? Yeah. Um, I really hope to spur a conversation and maybe – I hope you know people that watch this and listen to it uh, you know, enjoy it and it makes them think and they, you know, write in and they'd like to hear more about it. I'd love to, I'd love to do some more of these. So if people have specific to topics or demos they want to see done, I'm completely open to doing that. I can give any kind of demos, anything like that. So. Yeah. Some, some demos might, might actually be pretty good, especially, um, especially to, to show some of the differences between the, the Azure and AWS, uh, like, portals or services or tooling and, and stuff like that would actually probably be pretty good. So maybe we'll have a follow-up for that one. Yeah, actually, I think maybe one of the a follow up we could do would be uh, maybe if I could set up a test a AWS and a test Azure account and just do show the difference between a basic build of a, uh, a VNet in Azure and a basic build with, uh, uh, with AWS and put a single machine and show what the difference is in and how long it takes just between the two and the differences of what you got to go through between the two. Yeah. If people would be interested in something like that. So if you're listening out there, send us your ideas and I'll, I'll gladly set, you know, create a demo and we can do, we can, uh, we can do some stuff like that on shows. Yes. Okay, Graham, we will give some advanced heckle warning and uh, yeah, when we do the demo. <laughs> Uh, I think that would be a good demo session, huh? Cool. Yeah, I, th I think it'd be good. Um, I, you know, we haven't we haven't covered uh, we had done some some Azure stuff, uh, you know, over the summer, um, kind of in the middle of all the the Python series and stuff that was going on. So it'd be good to to show. And I, off the top of my head, can't even remember the last AWS content that there was. I know I know we didn't have anything on the books in 2019, so it would have it would have at best been the last quarter of 2018. 
Okay. Um, so it'd be good to get kind of some updates on that. But maybe, maybe maybe that's what we'll do is we'll just we I'll just uh, I'll create some demo accounts in both and we can uh, go through just a basic how to build a basic network and your first VM and show you the differences between the two. Yep. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, so yeah, all right. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Um, I, I know we went over by almost a good 20 minutes, but uh, hopefully it ended up being something that's uh, that's worthwhile. Um, if any of you guys heard any of the bits, I would say specifically around the beginning of the conversation with all the DevOps stuff, you know, if you have any interest in that or honestly just want to understand um, any of that for the culture shift and everything, if you have not read it yet and you're in IT, um, number one, shame on you, but number two, go pick up a copy of The Phoenix Project. It's an absolutely fantastic book. Um, the Unicorn Project actually just came out um, like right before Christmas. Um, and if anybody gets a copy of that, there's actually a good AMA session going on with uh, with Gene Kim that just started like this morning. Um, so there's pretty good discussions and stuff going on uh, online. But yeah, just start thinking about, you know, number one, just don't be the constraint keeping your company from doing stuff. You know, whatever that is, whatever it is that's actually the core of the business, don't be the one guy that's standing in the way. The one guy or gal, I don't want to be you know, sexist about it but don't be the one roadblock for things actually getting done. So just, you know, start considering what it is you're doing and make sure that you understand it. Yes. Hashtag don't be Brent. Good job, Tim. Um, it's one of my other Nemo co-leaders right there. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and stop the recording and we can have a chat for a couple minutes. Okay. <laughs>